So, what are the best grips on return of serve? I, I don't want to stick to just backhand. I want to I want to dive into the forehand as well. I want to look at how to prep the racket. Grip on the return of serve is insanely important. So let's dive into the forehand first. And and really before I get into this part of the court over here, I want to be very clear that when we're asking things like what is the best grip, you know, if I've got an eastern forehand grip, I don't want to then switch to full western for my forehand. If I've got an eastern backhand grip, I don't want to go to continental. Whatever grip is best for you on your ground strokes, that's what I want you using for return of serve. Now, I've got some tips on really how to prep the racket to put us in the best position to hit these returns well. All right, so for me, let's start with forehand. Because I'm a more forehand dominant player, I'm looking to return more balls with my forehand than with my backhand. So I like to set up in my eastern forehand grip and I wait for the return of serve in that position. Okay, now somebody like Djokovic, best returner of all time, he starts completely neutral. So he has a slight move to make to the forehand and he has a slight move to make to the backhand. Personally, I just want one side completely taken care of and if the ball gets delivered to the other side, then I'll make my move. So if you'll notice, Mark's gonna serve to my forehand right now. I'm already in my forehand grip and so once I see a forehand coming into this half of the court, I can commit to just swinging. Now, the bigger the ball comes, I might shorten up my backswing to ensure a good stroke, but watch the grip. It's not gonna have to move at all when I see a forehand return. Okay, so that makes life really simple. At least half of my returns to my forehand side, there is no grip change. And if Mark happened to put a ball near my body and I stepped around it a little bit, still no grip change. So my suggestion is go out and try that first. Start in a forehand grip that you use from the baseline. And now if a backhand return comes, then there's a move to be made, okay? Now, I have a one-handed backhand. So my ready position, the left hand, is on the throat of the racket. So when I need to make a grip change, when I see a backhand return come, the left hand is the key. I want the hitting hand really loose because it obviously needs to change position on the grip. So that hand is loose, the left hand is holding the racket a little bit tighter, and I'm able to rotate the racket until I get into my eastern backhand grip. So whatever grip you use on your backhand, let the left hand rotate the racket and when you find that spot on the grip then you can put some pressure back on the handle with your dominant hand. For all you two-handers out there, you know, you've got that left hand on the grip of the racket. Same idea though, let this hand hold it a little bit tighter, the right hand's a little looser so that the right hand makes the shift, the grip is now set, and now we're swinging into the return. All right, so let's watch from a forehand grip set position to see that backhand come. Left hand engages the grip change and I make my swing. Okay, so there's my backhand grip. Pretty solid return. Now, go out, watch the pros, pull up some YouTube videos, slow motion footage you're going to see, especially on the return of serve, not just ground strokes, but especially on the return of serve, where timing is such an issue, the grip is the first thing to get taken care of. So make sure when you're out practicing, you don't even want to feel, you know, a lunge to the ball before you've taken care of a grip change. You know, coming off my split, grip gets changed, and then I'm making my move. All right, it gets very confusing to try to change the grip to the right spot. If you're starting to move and starting to take the racket back, all that stuff before taking care of this. So I, I would leave you with that. Handle the grip change if there's one to be had before you do anything else when engaging a return of serve.
All right, so how do we handle huge serves? Usually something that I'm trying to do to the opponent, but in this case, I've got to know how to combat it. Two really big ways. The first is really just the idea of shortening my stroke, and I think it'll be really apparent, especially watching me, simply because I'm tall, I generally have a, a pretty large loop in my swing, but that's really where I want to go with this, is that my loop should still be intact when I'm seeing a lot of pace, I just want to make a smaller loop. All right, so if you'll notice, I'm going to have Mark serving a slower serve right now. Take a look at the size of the loop I'm going to make on my forehand. Okay? For me, it feels normal, but I'm sure on camera that, that looks pretty large. Now, if he added, let's say, 30 miles per hour to that ball, 40 miles per hour to that ball, and I tried to make the same size loop, I think we'd all agree there's a very good chance I'm going to hit late, and contact point is everything on the return of serve. I don't care how fast or slow the ball comes, the idea is we're trying to put the swing into contact slightly in front of the body. So if I'm making a big loop against a faster ball and I'm hitting late, contact is now compromised, and I can't expect to hit great returns. So I will shorten my loop and be very careful. Notice I said shorten my loop. I don't want to see this where we're going straight back. This is ultimately what I would say is too compact and kills the rhythm of more of this modern swing. So just think smaller C-shape, not eliminate the C-shape. So Mark, let's try to juice it up a little bit and let's see if I can make a little smaller stroke on the return. Okay, so got my contact point out in front. I might have mishit that a little bit, but again, there's, there's a little leeway to be had, even with a slight mishit, so long as contact in occurs in front of the body. So I achieved that. I think my swing got smaller. You guys will be the judge. Now, if you'll notice the follow-through on that, there is no way that my follow-through is going to be traditional up around my shoulder on a faster, bigger serve from the opponent. So be very much okay with the idea that the swing might only get just in front of your chest. Maybe it wraps around a little bit, but it's gonna be more abbreviated naturally because of the speed of the ball. So you don't have to have that picture in your head that you're meant to be out and around over that left shoulder at the end of the swing against the faster shot. Backhand, very similar idea. Let's see a slower serve into my backhand return. I think you'll notice, you know, I get that racket nice and propped up. Pretty decent sized kind of reverse C shape here. Okay, so again, I, I'm not seeing that right there, but it feels like the racket's nice standard height backswing. If he gets faster, Again, do I want to just take the racket back to my left hip? Absolutely not. I've got a swing that I've practiced long and hard to master. I just have to make it smaller. So as I'm recognizing more speed, I just engage this, this little smaller loop in order to ensure good contact in front of me. And again, the follow through will most likely be abbreviated probably somewhere right here at the end of the swing. All right, that'll work for sure. And again, if my accuracy is a little off, fine. I'm just trying to get the racket in front of my body so I have a chance to return a fast serve. So that's option number one, is shortening the backswing on both sides. Option number two, and this to me is definitely more appropriate for singles, is just to back up, okay? I see this at the club level a lot, where the confidence level of returning a fast serve from farther away goes a lot higher. You don't see those aces get blown by you. So by standing a little farther away, this allows for a couple things. Simply one is more reaction time. I've got a longer time to see the ball off Mark's racket, and because I have more time to see the ball off Mark's racket, I might be able to get away with something a little close to my standard size loop on both sides of, of my stroke. 
okay? Obviously a few things become a little more difficult. Covering the out wide serve from farther away is a little more difficult. And in doubles, think about it, I have a net player right up in front of me. If I want that extra reaction time and that bigger stroke, it would allow a net player in front of me to probably get more chances at poaching my ball. So I would still say the only option for returning the fast serve adjustment in doubles is stay on top of the baseline a little more and shorten the swing. But for singles especially, let's work on trying to get back and play a little more of a standard stroke. So, Mark, let's have a crack at it. A little bigger swing from you. See what I can pull off from back here. Yeah, take that all day. See one on the forehand maybe. All right, so I caught it a little bit late. Even from there, I might have to tailor that backswing a little bit, but a little more time, a little more space allows for what I feel is a, a more standard swing. So that's something to try back there for sure. Be very aware of the out wide serve though. It's very hard to cover the deeper you go back, okay? Now, you guys might be wondering, well, Brady, why, why go through all this trouble when I could probably just block a chip right back? And I'll say this, I mean, unless the depth of your chip is really good, meaning gets it right back on the server's shoes, think about what they're dealing with off a of fast serve. They've got all this momentum from a big swing, probably carried them forward, and now a short chip return, here they come and they're probably just tagging a put away ball. So let's have a look. If I get it deep, cool, but I think there's a good chance, you know, that's, that's what's happening right there. So it's, it's too much survival mode for me to sign off on just the chip return unless you've got such good touch with it that you know you can get it into the back third of the tennis court. If that's happening, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want you to live by that rule. Try to mix and match some of these other returns, but that's definitely usable if there's some depth on the chip, okay? So those, those two ideas, let's, let's work on shortening up the backswing, and if that's not working, play a little deeper position. And probably the best way to have some fun with it is mix and match the two. Don't feel like you gotta live by one or live by the other. It's always cool to, to have some variety in those returns. All right, so how do I figure out where the serve is gonna go? Pretty simply put, the toss is the only kind of factor that I can look at and say, all right, I've got a really good idea what's going on here. Especially at the 3-5, 4-0 level. Once we're getting up into high 4-5, 5-0, there's some disguise going on, but, but for right now, let's look at a couple things that we can see at a 4-0 level that make it really clear what, as the returner, I should be doing. All right, so the first is the idea of the toss going out to about 1 or 130. Okay, so again, with the server standing there, directly in front of him is 12 o'clock. 1 o'clock, 130. I think you'd all agree that if you see a server coming pretty far out here to the right, slice serve is coming. That's for a right-handed player. If we're looking at a lefty, which I'll, I'll kind of touch on later, that, that spot would obviously be different. But as I'm standing here returning around 4-0 level and I see my opponent toss a ball up to about 1 or 130, I can guarantee slice is coming because they're reaching far enough to the right that the ball reflects back. It's going to have some slice on it. What you don't want to assume is that that serve always is going to be super out wide. Don't forget, a slice serve could go down the tee. The spin will bring it towards your body, but the one thing we don't want to do is see one or 130 and just immediately be running to the side. What I will do, Mark, go ahead and toss it up to about 130 for me and just hold it there. When I see that, I will shade a little bit because I'm still thinking the spin down the tee could come into me. I don't want to get the backhand too jammed up and I do want to be a little bit closer to covering the out wide ball. 
All right, so the toss goes up to one or one thirty. Assume slice, shade over. Don't just start B lining out wide, but then get ready to make that jump to handle the spin. More often than not, it will be out wide, but let's have a look here. Okay, so standard return position. One thirty goes up. All right, so. Again, I'm not playing tennis where I know exactly where my opponent hits the ball, but the toss can indicate a lot to at least make me confident on the return. And as we all know, the return is just one of the tougher shots in tennis to handle. It's a tough shot to just feel like you're going to be great at. But a little tip off like that by the opponent is super helpful. Like I said, at higher levels, Mark, go ahead and toss one to about 12, 12.30 for me. Okay, so at higher levels, that toss right there, he could hit a flat bomb up the tee, he could hit slice out wide. I've got to be a little more careful not to just assume slice there. But as that ball gets wider, 1, 130, the player is more of a 3, 5, 4, 0 player, you can definitely assume slice. Now, the other end of the spectrum would be a toss that goes to the left, all right? The only serve that can be struck from the left side of a right-handed hitter's body is a kick serve. So if Mark tosses that ball and I think kick serve, what do I know? The ball's going to be rising. Generally on the deuce side, that serve will come up the tee, okay? Not to say he couldn't manufacture some out wide kick. I don't know why he would. It's high to my forehand. But again, I know what the spin is. I know what his intentions are. And I have a really good idea of the direction of the serve. Not to say that it's all a lock. It just, again, it helps my confidence level when I'm stepping up to return to really be aware of where that toss is. So now in this return position, I'm going to have him hit one from that 1130 spot and watch my reaction. <sighs> okay. So there's a huge bonus. If I am completely unaware that a toss to 1130 is most likely a kick serve, well, not most likely, definitely a kick serve, and most likely down the tee, I'm not shading a little bit left. But because I am aware, I shade left. Now all of a sudden, what would have been a high backhand, nobody's favorite shot in tennis ever, now becomes kind of this nice run around high forehand and not, you know, a bad idea of me to actually go up the line there. Okay, so what a tip off, what a nice little piece of intel this is that simply as I'm stepping up, I'm not just shaking in my boots worrying about this guy serving to me, I'm picking out the toss, right, telling myself slice, left, telling myself kick, having a little piece of footwork built into that information I just got, giving myself the best chance to hit a solid, solid return of serve there. So how do we return a kick serve? All right, so a couple things have to happen. Anticipation number one. Um, obviously, when I see the toss get to Mark's left side, probably about 11.30, maybe 11 if he's got a ton of knee bend. Once I see it there, I know he's calling on that kick serve. You look at Federer, I'm at the ad side of the court right now. Federer uses a kick serve for a second serve on the ad side 90% of the time. So a lot of times it's not like this guy's trying to, to, trying to disguise that he's hit, hitting a kick serve, but again, it helps me to be aware and get a good jump on the ball if I see that toss go left. So let's have a look at one of those real quick where I'm seeing the toss left and then I want you to take note of my reaction once I see that ball on his left. Okay, so something right about there. If you notice, I got a land from my split. Okay, not to say he couldn't hit a kick down the tee, so therefore I got a split in case I got a push to the middle, but generally he's trying to work me out wide. Now, see a lot of players do this, where they know that kick serve's gonna bring them wide, 
So the resulting footwork off the split is to just run down the baseline. The problem with this is that the farther away you guys are from the bounce, the higher that ball is getting. And like I said, you know, we just don't want to be dealing with too high of a backhand on this outside part of the court. Something around shoulder height is a lot better option. So notice, coming off the split, I actually take a direct line into the alley, essentially cutting the tennis ball off from its landing point. By moving in on a diagonal, I'm going to be able to catch the ball slightly earlier, which means lower. And I don't want you guys sprinting in, going to try to get it you know, off your shoes. That's not anything that's going to help you trying to go short hop or return a serve. So know that shoulder height's a good idea. So I'm recognizing the toss to the left. I'm coming off a good split, coming in diagonally into the baseline, trying to take a crack at this kick serve return from somewhere around shoulder height. Last piece of the puzzle, cross court, cross court, cross court. Do not try to return this ball up the line unless you're up 6-0, 5-0, 40-love, okay? Cross court it is. Here we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, again, where's my position here? <laughs> Obviously, I'm in the alley. Cross court, what's nice about that is that, you know, I probably hit that maybe a little too much middle. A little wider is better. But if I go cross court to Mark, he, unless I hit it really poorly, he'd be a little crazy to try to rip a backhand up the line changing the direction of my return. So have faith that even though we're way out here, you're going to have time to recover slightly and there's a very good chance the next ball you're seeing is somewhere between the middle of the court and cross court again. That's if this guy's a smart player. Let's hope he's not and he takes a chance up the line and makes a bunch of unforced errors. But there's your key. Recognize that toss to the left. Anticipate by moving diagonal, shoulder height ball, cross court return. Now, I've gotten texts in the past, I've gotten all sorts of stuff. Brady, I just want to return it from a lot farther away once it's actually dropping down towards the second bounce. And I think you understand, I'd have to be really deep in the court off a good kick serve to hit it from way back there. All right, now there's one instance where that's actually okay. It's if there's no chance in singles that the server is going to follow the ball in. If there's any chance they have a decent volley and they might follow it in and you're standing back here by this fence, you cannot make that play. But if they just have no volley, again, it's not doubles. I have a net player in front of me in doubles. I can't sit back there because the net player has a chance to get all over that ball from farther away. But let's just look at the scenario where Mark's hitting a kick, I know he's not coming to the net, and let's see what kind of swing I can make back here. Might even be able to run around this a little bit. <sighs> All right, so there it is right there. That is a good opportunity. I, I ran around my backhand, hit a forehand from eight to 10 feet behind the baseline, Knowing that Mark's not going to come in, I actually went on offense there. Save that if you just absolutely know he's not going to close on you. Otherwise, we got to use this play, cut it off diagonally, shoulder height ball, cross court. That is the recipe for returning kick serves.